Welcome to module 38 of Point Set Topology Part 1. So far we have studied connectivity, path connectivity, local connectivity, local path connectivity and so on. So it's time to take up another very important concept, compactness. As a tagging along, the Lindelofness can also be studied, which is not all that important for us. And quite often, just like you study connectivity and path connectivity to the compactness and the Lindelofness go hand in hand. However, from the point of view of point set topology, compactness is so important. If you try to tell the story of compactness by which I mean how the concept developed and so on. It will be half of the story of point set topology. So, so important is the compactness concept. I will not be able to do historical uh, uh, any remarks and so on because quite often they can be done only in the perspective, only after uh, after knowing what we wanted to do, what, what has been done and so on. Then, oh, why this one, why this one and so on. Then you can go back and dig up history, historical development, motivations and so on. So let us start studying compactness in its earnest. Start with the topological space X. A subset of X, so let us say A, will be called compact if the following happens. Suppose you cover A by open subsets of X, some arbitrary cover. Then it must admit a finite sub cover. So let me define all these things carefully. Sub cover, open cover, what is the meaning of sub uh, finite sub cover and so on. Okay. <laughs> so a family UI of subsets of X is called a cover. This I think we have defined earlier, but let us recall. If A is contained inside the union of this family, it is called an open cover if every member of this family. This, all these UIs are open. So one can have closed coverings also. They seem to be not so important. Okay. By a sub cover of a family for a given set, first of all, it must be a cover. Then you take a sub family of UIs, which will be also a cover for the same set A. Such a thing will be called sub cover. If this sub cover happens to be a finite or countable, then we will say that is a countable sub cover or finite sub cover accordingly. So once we have these definitions, a subset A is called compact if every open cover of A has a finite sub cover for it. Likewise, we say A is Lindelof. If every open cover of A has a countable sub cover for it, okay. Deliberately, I have not put you know compact space and compact set and so on. Whatever you want to call it, if you want to think of this as a subspace, you are welcome. If you are think of this as set, we are welcome. Compact set or compact subspace. What I have defined is a compactness here. Similarly, Lindelofness here. Okay. However, 
you may wonder why the subsets. Suppose this A is the whole of X, then it makes sense. All these definitions make sense. Then we may say that X is a compact you know, space by itself. No subspace, no subset. <laughs> a compact space. So in its own topology, take an open cover, any open cover, you can extract a finite subcover. And you may not be able to extract, the definition gives you a finite subcover out of it. That is the whole point. So, so that's what I have repeated here. Namely, you can call a topological space compact or Lindelof space if it is compact Lindelof as a subset of itself. Okay. It is immediate that a subset A containing this radix is compact or Lindelof. If and only if it is compact or Lindelof as a subspace. You take subspace topology, then as a space, it must be compact and Lindelof. These two are equivalent because you have an open cover, open subsets coming from the larger space intersect it with the given set, they will cover. And those are the open subsets in the subspace. So these two notions are same. There is no uh, difference between them. In particular, you will see that once a space is compact, it does not matter where it is contained inside as a subspace. Right? Suppose X is a compact space. Suppose X is contained inside Y as a subspace or Z as a subspace. Both the cases, it will be still compact subspace. Okay. Now, if you take a closed subspace of a compact space, automatically it will be compact. Similarly, if you take a closer space of a Lindelof space, automatically it will be Lindelof. So how does one get it? Just add one extra open set, namely the complement of the closer set. That will become a cover for the whole space. From that, you can get a countable or finite subcover. Now throw away the extra thing. You don't need it to cover A. So you have still uh, uh, you know, countable subcover or a finite subcover. So that is all the trick here. By extending the given cover for the subspace, which is a closed subspace, by putting one extra element, namely the complement of that set. And then you can come back. Let X be a topological space and B be a base for X. Then X is compact, respectively Lindelof. See, quite often, uh, whatever I do for compactness, I can put it inside a bracket Lindelof, but not always. Huh? When it is not, I will mention that. If and only if every cover for X admits uh, a finite, but every cover of X from members of B admits a finite cover, subcover. You see, in the definition of compactness, you want to have every open cover should admit a finite subcover. But here is a restricted thing here. Members of B cover it. They, are, they don't give all the open covers. But if it is satisfied, condition is satisfied for members of B, which is a subclass of open covers. Suppose you take a covering of X with only members of B and they admit a sub finite subcover. That is enough, is what this theorem says, this lemma says. Okay. So this is the role of base to cut down our toil. You don't have to check it for all open covers. You have to just check it for covers coming from members of B. 
this is the gist of this uh, lemma here okay the proof is very easy one way is clear namely if you take a cover out of b that will be also an open cover in the general case so it must admit a finite sub cover okay now suppose this happens for only members of open covers coming from members of b then why it should be true for any general covering that's what you have to start right okay so let the condition hold and uj be an open cover for x not necessarily from members of b then for each x in x we have x must be inside one of the open sets here ujx okay depends upon x okay but then b is a base means what there must be an element bx inside b so that x is inside bx contained inside ujx now if you will vary all the x that will cover this b axis will cover x now by this condition there will be a finite cover out of these b x let us call them as b x 1 b x 2 b x n but each b x i is contained inside the corresponding u j x i therefore x is contained inside union b x i contained inside union of j x i so these were the members from the original cover Okay, if you write n, if you replace n by infinity here, you will get Lindelofness. So proof of for the Lindelof property is also the same thing here. Okay, the next immediate thing is the following: under a continuous map, compactness and Lindelofness are preserved. What is the meaning of this? F from X to Y is a continuous map. X is compact implies Fx is compact. X is Lindelof implies Fx is Lindelof. Just like connectivity, local um, uh, or path connectivity, etc. Right? Not local connectivity. Connectivity and path connectivity we have seen. What does that mean? Immediately it means that under homeomorphisms, compactness and Lindelofness are preserved. In other words, they are topological properties now, okay, in our formal definition. Okay, take A contained inside X, B contained inside Y, where X tau and Y tau prime are topological spaces. Suppose A is compact, respectively, Lindelof, and we have surjective function F from a tau a to b tau prime b is tau restricted to a tau prime restricted to b they are subspace topologies and this is a continuous function here you don't need f to be defined on the whole of x and y whole of x to y we have to show that b is compact if a is compact okay respectively lindelof all right so how do you do that? Very easy. Start with an open cover for B. F inverse of UI intersection B. See, UIs are now open subsets in tau prime. Okay. And all that you have is B is contained in the union of UIs. But if you intersect UI intersection B, this is an open subset of the subspace topology. F is continuous. F inverse will be open inside A. Okay. And since this is a covering, F inverse of all these unions, okay, is the whole of A, which is the same thing as union of all F inverse of your intersection B. So I have got an open cover for A. Okay, you can go back to topology X here, okay, just for fun. Huh? What do you have to do? What are what is the meaning of these are open subsets? Each open subset f inverse of vi intersection b is some vi intersection a where vi's are open in x. In any case, these vi's will now cover a because they are obviously larger than the original space here. Okay, a itself is contained here, so a will be contained here also. 
देर फोर दिस फाइनाइट रिस्पेक्टिवली काउंटेबल सबसेट आई कंटेंट इन साइड जे सबसेट ए इज कंटेंट इन साइड द यूनियन ऑफ वी आई आई ओवर आई दिस इज बाय कॉम्पैक्टनेस और लिंडेलोफनेस बट नाउ यू कैन कम बैक बिकॉज दीज थिंग्स आर लार्जर देन एफ इनवर्स ऑफ यू आई intersection b so b will be contained inside the corresponding uis which is either finite cover or a countable okay so that is the consequence of this elementary result namely under continuous functions compactness is preserved therefore it is a topological property in particular it follows that compactness of a subset a of topological space x does not depend on how a is sitting inside x i am repeating it again once a is homeomorphic to another a prime a and a prime are sitting wherever they like okay inside a subspace if one is compact other one is compact over this is the same thing with Lindelofness, connectivity, path connectivity, etc. That we have studied. They are all topological properties. That is the whole idea. Now there is a partial converse here. Converse means what? Compactness from the domain to co-domain we have seen. Now we want to go on the other way. Suppose you have a surjective open mapping. in particular it will be quotient also but not just a quotient surjective open mapping if y is compact and each fiber is compact then x is compact so this is similar to connectivity wherein we had just a surjective is a, a quotient map only not necessarily open mapping Open surjective map is a quotient, but not the conversely, right? So weaker condition, we had similar result for connectivity. Okay, weak under weaker condition, but now for compactness we have put a stronger condition, surjective open mapping. You will see why this is true in the proof. Why we needed open set here, open mapping here. Okay, right now don't worry about uh, why it doesn't work for quotient, just quotients, and so on. So let us work out this one. Take an open cover for X. We have to extract a finite subcover for each Y in Y. Choose a subcover U Y one, U Y K Y for Q inverse of Y. The Q inverse of Y is given to be compact, a compact subset of X, and U is an open cover for the whole of X, so it will be a cover for Q inverse Y also. Okay, so now I can take a cover for finite cover for Q inverse Y. Okay, for each fiber you get a cover. Number of elements here will depend upon Y. Okay, I am just listed them as Q Y one. Q Y K Y, okay, which is not a very good uh, notation. I should have uh, perhaps you know Q Y one and so that is not correct because Y is fixed here, so indexing has to be only changed. Okay, so put W Y equal to in intersection of all this this Q of U I ones. U I U Y one, U Y two, etc. But take Q of that. I want this one to be an open set. This is a finite intersection. If each of them is open, this will be open. So what is the guarantee that these are open? These sets are open. Q of that will be open, provided Q is an open map. And that is why I have put that condition. I want this one to be an open map. Open set. This open set definitely contains Y. Okay, so call this as W Y. All right. For each point Y, 
I have constructed an open subset in a very peculiar way. Okay, that's very important. Now you vary the point Y in the capital Y. What do you get? You will get a cover for Y. That Y is compact, therefore, what you get is a finite subcover here, y, y, y belong to y, for y, say, y is contained inside w, y, j, j range from 1 to n. There will be finitely many points, neighborhoods of those things which I have chosen already, they will cover the whole of y. Okay. On each u, on each w, y, 1, there will be n sets sitting above some ky sets sitting above. So for each of them, you take those sets here, u, y, j, i, i running from 1 to k, y, j, j itself running over y1, y2, y, n. So this is a finite family. For each fixed j, there are finitely many members and j itself runs over a finite. These will cover now the entire of X. Okay. That's the whole idea. Take any point X. Okay. Q of X must have, must be inside one of these. Right. Then Q inverse of that will be covered by one of these elements. Oh, that's because of this one. Q inverse of that part will be covered by that. Okay. So, we have proved one very important result here, namely, under surjective open mappings, compactness can be obtained backwards, namely, Y is compact and fibers are compact, then X is compact. So, you can come the reverse way now. Okay. Yes. Haan. This does uh, this may not hold for Lindell openness, right? Because yeah, why? Because you see, not be open. you cannot take, uh, you know, you can't take count. You may have to take countable intersection here because here you may get countable things, right? Right. But there are different way you can uh, you can generalize this one. Think about that. How can I generalize? How far I can generalize? Okay, think about that. There is no time for going into all that details. Directly Lindelofness is not possible here. Okay, this statement in general is not, not true also. Not only the proof doesn't work, in general it is not true. Now, another important uh, landmark result, finite product of Compact spaces is compact. Converse is easy. Why? Because if the product is compact, you can take the projection maps. They are open surjective. Therefore, each factor xi is compact if the product is compact. It is the converse that we want to attack. But the converse will all come just by this theorem itself inductively once i prove it for two then you can use inductively right so for two what do i do look at pi y from x cross y to y which is the projection to the y coordinate you can you can check x coordinate also if you want one of them this is an open surjective mapping y is compact X is compact, so X cross singleton Y, all of them are what? They are all homeomorphic to X. Okay, and they are the fibers here. Pi Y inverse of singleton Y is X cross singleton Y. Okay, so you can directly apply the theorem to say that X cross Y is compact. Now, induct. X cross Y cross Z will be compact because Z is compact and X cross Y is compact and so on. 
So finite product, there is no problem. All right. The theorem is true for infinite products also. And that goes celebrated theorem of Tikhonov. But for that, you will have to wait a little bit. Hmm. Now, another interesting uh, diversion here, suddenly, the following result has a flavor of Cantor's intersection theorem for metric spaces, complete metric spaces. Here, there is no metric, no completion, no deltas and so on. Something funny happens, but you have to put, what you have to put, start with a compact topological space. Okay, so let X be a compact topological space. F1 contains F2, contains F3, etc. Sequence of non empty closed sets. Okay, non empty is obviously necessary, whatever I am trying to say. They are decreasing sequences, they must here. Okay, and they are closed subsets of the compact set. Then then the entire intersection is non-empty. You see, in the Cantor's intersection theorem, finally, you had a unique point there. But non-emptiness was very important. So the same kind of conclusion can be got out of compactness instead of complete metric space and so on. In the complete metric space, you needed more uh, stringent conditions here. Is almost less condition. Apply De Morgan law. It is a one line proof that too. Okay. If this is empty, what does it mean? If you take the complement, which is the whole space, the complement of the intersection is the union of the complements. What are the complements? They will be increasing, increasing, you know, subsets each of them open and they cover the whole space X. That means what? By fire compactness, at some finite stage, it must be equal to the whole space. Right? Some Fn will be equal to the whole space because it's a finite cover now. Whatever you take, the, the biggest one will cover the whole thing. Right? But then what happens? If you go back to the De Morgan law, the corresponding u n is whole space means f n is empty, and that's a contradiction. <laughs> f i is a non empty sort. So just apply De Morgan law, you get the proof. Okay? So, like this, we can go on taking some glimpses of you know, compact spaces and so on. By the way, there is no, no such result for Lindelof spaces. So let us uh, do uh, take a look at metric spaces again and get some more hints for wh what kind of things we can do with compact spaces. Okay, so that is next time. Thank you.